We are live streaming on Facebook now, and we have Nancy Krulik with us. We're so excited to be back again. Uh, again, welcome back to the Book Fairies uh, second annual Once Upon a Readathon event. This is a month long event, and it's an effort to raise both awareness and funds for our mission. The mission is to remove access to books as a barrier to achieving literacy. Um, it's not too late for you guys to participate if you want to get involved in the fundraiser. We have You can get involved by uh, joining reading events like we're doing today, and we have a lot of great schools that are participating. Uh, you can become a fundraiser if you want to. It's not too late. You can promote literacy by committing to reading for 30 minutes a day for a month. Um, or you can participate uh, by making a donation. No amount is too small. Uh, for anyone who wants more information, we're going to be posting the link to the fundraising platform and the calendar of events in the comments section. So we hope you'll join in and um, be a part of the event. We are so excited to have Nancy Krulik back with us again today. She's been with us for a couple of years now. She joined the Readathon last year as well. Nancy has written over 200 books for children and young adults. It was beginning with Katie Kazoo, Switcheroo. Then she went into the How I Survived Middle School series, Grosset and George uh, Brown, the Class Clown series, Princess Pulverizer, who doesn't love that, and many more. But today we have a really exciting treat for everybody. Nancy's going to be reading from one of her books. It's, uh, it's a new series. It's Miss Frogbottom's Field Trip series. It has been described as the magic school bus, which I always loved, and the magic treehouse, another favorite, in a new chapter series about a teacher who uses a magical map to take her class all over the world to face mythical creatures and learn about the places they all call home. I know I can't wait for her to talk about and read from Miss Frogbottom's adventures. How about everyone else? Welcome, Nancy. Hi, how are you guys? This is my new series. Ms. Frogbottom's Field Trips. And this is the very first book. Um, it's called, I Want My Mummy. And if you take a look at the cover, I bet you can guess where they go. So I'm just going to so read a little bit from the first chapter. That's great. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to step out. I'm going to uh, let you be the focus because so, everybody's here to see you, not, not me. Um, but I want to just say Ms. Katz's school is here. We have, um, excuse me, <clears throat> losing my voice. We have Mrs. Um, well, we got a lot of from the same school, so I'm just looking down. Uh, we have um, a lot of Miss Otera's third grade class from PS uh, 349Q is in the house. Mrs. Capianco's third grade class from PS 349 in Queens is here, and we have a, a number of people from PS 349. So that's awesome. I'm going to hop out. I'm going to let you read. When you're done, I'll come back in and we'll do a Q&A. How's that sound? Got it. All, All right. right. Good luck. Thanks. Thanks. You know that skin that sticks out from the side of your fingernails? The kind that looks like pieces of shredded string? I hate that skin, which is why I'm always picking at it. It makes my mother crazy when I pick. But stringy skin is really annoying. So I keep picking and picking and picking. Luckily, my mom's not here to yell at me. I'm in school waiting for the bell to ring and for my teacher, Ms. Frogbottom, to show up. Ms. Frogbottom doesn't scold me for picking at the skin around my fingernails, or at least she hasn't yet. Hey, Tony, my best friend Oliver says as he and his twin sister, Olivia, walk into the classroom. Oliver hangs his jacket and his backpack on a book on a hook and walks over to my desk. How was your weekend? Did your cousin take you to see that movie about summer camp? Yeah, I reply, it was okay. Just okay? Olivia asks, butting into our conversation. We loved it. I liked most of it, I explain. Just not that part where the bear shows up while they're making s'mores. That scared me. Did I mention that I hate being scared? Oliver and I had our fencing competition on Saturday, Olivia says. Guess who came in first place? Olivia is wearing a huge gold covered plastic medal around her neck, which of course means she came in first. I have a feeling Olivia is just wearing the medal to annoy Oliver. I don't know how he puts up with her. Check out Sophia, Oliver says, changing the subject. She's already got her math book open. I don't know why Oliver sounds so surprised. Sophia is the class brain. 
She's always got her nose in a book or in her tablet looking something up. Okay, you can't really have your nose in a tablet, but you know what I mean. Sophia is so busy solving a math problem just for fun that she doesn't even look up at the sound of her name. Do you know why the math book was always upset? I'll, Olivia asks Oliver. Because it had so many problems, Oliver answers her and the twins start laughing hysterically. Miss Frogbottom's coming. Suddenly my classmate, Aiden, who has been standing near the door shouts out a warning. He races to his desk and sits in his seat. The twins sit down too. Now we're all in our places with bright shiny faces, except Emma, Aiden exclaims, sit down. You know how mad Miss Frogbottom gets if we're not all seated when she gets here. I look over at the window. Emma is staring at her reflection in the glass. She's moving her head around and making funny expressions like smiles and frowns and something that looks like duck lips. Emma, hurry! Aiden sounds worried and I don't blame him. I don't want Miss Frogbottom to be in a bad mood right at the start of the day. Emma stops staring at herself long enough to glare at, Aaron, at Aiden. Are you talking to me? Because if you are, my name's not Emma, it's Rainbow. I'm not surprised by that. Last Friday, Emma told everyone she changed her name to Starshine. And a few days before that, it was Moonglow. Rainbow is a much better name for a painter, she explains. I thought you were going to be an actress when you grew up, Olivia says. I can be both, Emma replies. Fine, Aiden huffs. You gotta sit down, Rainbow. Emma, or Rainbow, takes her seat just as Miss Frogbottom walks into the room. Good morning, class 4A, our teacher greets us as she puts her backpack down on the floor beside her desk. Good morning, Miss Frogbottom, we answer. Miss Frogbottom isn't the kind of teacher to waste time asking us how our weekends were. She's the kind of teacher who gets right to work, which is why she's all writing the word of the day on the board. Miss Frogbottom, the bell hasn't rung yet, Olivia reminds our teacher. Bad move. Miss Frogbottom shoots her a look. Olivia sinks down in her seat and starts copying the word of the day in her notebook. Arachnophobia, noun, fear of spiders. That will be an easy one for me to remember. I'm scared of spiders. Speaking of spiders, Miss Frogbottom says, I hope you all did your homework and read chapter three in Charlotte's Web because ugh, we had reading homework over the weekend. Maybe Miss Frogbottom signed it while I was watching that freaky cockroach walk around the windowsill because I really wasn't listening to her then. Pop quiz, but I'm listening now. Pop quiz are two words I dread, especially because I didn't read chapter three. I start picking nervously at the skin around my fingernails again. Why did I have to get the new fourth grade teacher this year? Miss Frogbottom isn't like any of the other teachers here at Left Turn Alleyway Elementary. I bet those teachers don't give weekend homework or surprise quizzes. And don't even get me started on how Miss Frogbottom is always talking about the magic of field trips. Now I'm biting the skin around my fingernails. I pull hard at one really annoying skin string with my teeth. Ow! Uh-oh. I'm bleeding. Hey, I exclaim, anybody got a Band-Aid? Miss Frogbottom stops talking and stares at me. Oops. I just called out without raising my hand. I brace myself for a warning, of course. Surprisingly, Miss Frogbottom smiles. I don't have one, Tony, she tells me, although I do know a place where you can find lots of bandages. Miss Frogbottom reaches into her backpack and pulls out a giant map. A map so huge that there's no way it could possibly fit into that pack. And yet it does. I wish I'd never asked for that Band-Aid. I should have just let myself bleed all over the place because I know that map. It's not a regular map. It's a magic map. A map that can take us any place in the world. I'm just glad Miss Frogbottom doesn't pull out that map every day. If she did, I'd never come to school because every time she points to a place on that thing, Something scary happens. Like the time Sophia almost got captured by a Muldrewank monster in Australia. If the monster had gotten her, it would have been awful. Muldrewank monsters cover their victims with ooey gooey pus filled blisters that pop up all over. 
Then there was that day in Greenland when Emma twisted her ankle running from a Tupelok statue that had come to life and was trying to make her her prisoner. I sure hope we don't go somewhere cold this time because I only have a t-shirt on. Miss Frogbottom is pointing to some place on the map. I can't tell where because my hands are over my eyes. Even through my fingers though, I can see a giant flash of light glowing in the classroom. My body feels weightless and I think my feet have just left the ground. It's like I'm flying in space. And then, and that's the end of chapter one. Thank you so much. I hope you guys like that. So if you guys have questions, I'm here to take them. Eileen, hi. I can't hear you. You're on mute. Sorry about that. I'm getting okay. all discombobulated. It's crazy. So that was, that's awesome. So how many, what are those four books in that series, correct? Right now there are four. Um, hopefully there'll be more. So yeah, okay. it's been a lot of fun. Um, some of the places are places that I've been and some are places I just got to research and that was great. That's awesome. Um, someone is asking, what was your first book? My very first book was a nonfiction picture book called Real Robots. And it was about robots that helped out in hospitals, with police officers, in factories, with the disabled or the differently abled. Um, yeah, so that was my very first book. It was a picture book and you can't get it anymore. It's what they call out of print, which means okay. they don't make it anymore, but you might find it in a library or a used bookstore. Okay, and then we have Lisa Camilli is asking, um, exciting first chapter, what f &P level would you suggest for this book? You know, to be honest, I don't write at levels. I just sort of write the books. Um, I'm not really sure, but I'm sure if you go on Simon & Schuster's website, they have it listed that way. Okay. I don't know many authors that write to level. Mm -hmm. sort of write the way we feel it. And then someone does the computer analysis. And then they level it. Yeah, we have amazing volunteers that come into our warehouse. And I want to give back a shout out to Janet and Carol, they come in and they help level books. The new books that come in, they level them for us so that we can get them out to the kids um, that deserve them. I, um, I just know that it's a chapter book. It's a chapter book, that's perfect. Um, and then uh, Shimo Khan wanted to know how long did it take you to write this book? Um, it's interesting. The first book in every series always takes me longer than any other. Um, usually by the time I'm in the middle of a series, I can, get it done in about four weeks. But the first book is tougher because I'm getting to know the characters and the premise. Um, what happens with me is I usually will do an outline first. So I know the beginning, the middle and the end, very basic. And then I'll write what's called a first draft. And a first draft is basically, some people call it a sloppy copy. It's when you write the <laughs> whole story all the way through, but you're gonna change it. And then mm -hmm. I usually send that to my editor and she sort of acts like a teacher. So she reads it. And sometimes she'll write things on it like, this is the funniest thing I ever read. I was sitting on the subway going to work reading it and I laughed so hard, everybody moved away from me because they thought I was crazy. And I oh, love that's so that. funny. And I love sloppy copy. That's, that's yeah. great. Great way to, great, great to uh, describe it. And um, sometimes she'll write on it though. I don't know what you were thinking. This is not funny. You have to do this again. This is, this is not gonna work. And that's when I have to revise or rewrite or redo. And I know all the kids out there have seen that on their papers too. This is not your best work, please redo, please rethink. I also know that most of you don't wanna do that. They don't, you don't wanna revise, you don't wanna rewrite, you don't wanna rethink, but the truth is everybody, every single author revises and every single author rewrites. And every time you do, it gets a little bit better, a little bit funnier. This book, I had to rewrite this, I would say four times until my editor and I agreed that it was funny enough and the characters were real enough um, for you guys to enjoy it and to really get something out of it. And what was fun about the Ms. Frogbottom books is that they are definitely fiction, they're definitely made up, but they also have a nonfiction element because you know the kids go to different, different places. And so I have included Frogbottom facts in every single book. And those are real facts about every place they visit in the book. So those made the, it take even longer because I had to do a lot of nonfiction research to mm -hmm. write the fiction books. So the first book, this particular book probably took me six to eight weeks to get finished. 
But the subsequent books that came after usually took about four because by then I knew the characters. I knew how they would get there, how the magic map would work, that kind of thing. All of that had to be worked out for the first book. So I hope that answers your question. It does. And what I like about the lesson that you just gave everybody is that sometimes, you know, having to rewrite or redo your work is really not punishment. It's how it's just helping you to be better, how to get a better product out. And exactly. we all have to do it, whether you're doing it in school, I do it in my job, you didn't do it in your job. And it's not punishment. It's just trying to make you the end result better and you better at what you do craft better you know learn your craft profess you know get your craft believe me any author that comes to your school or zooms with you and tells them they don't revise or rewrite is lying <laughs> and you can tell them nancy krulik said so <laughs> um what inspired you to become an author i love to read i love to read i have always loved to read it has always been my way of relaxing, my way about learning more about the world, uh, my way of getting my imagination going. And I want kids to love reading as much as I do. So I've always figured if I write funny books, kids will want to read them. And then they will get as hooked on reading as I do, as I okay. am. Someone did ask how many books you had written. I had said that you had done 200, but I, is it it's more than 200? more like 250 now. It's, wow. it's a lot of books. Um, in the Katie Kazoo series alone, there are over 40 books. So it's a lot. Katie Kazoo is awesome. Thanks. That's awesome. Um, and then Leah Wade wanted to know, do you like writing books? Um, I do. I, I find that writing, it's fun because I can create the entire universe and control the universe. And so the bad guys always get theirs in the end and the good guys can always win, which you know is how I would like the world to be. Mm -hmm. um, and also the kids in my books do exactly what I tell them to do. And my own kids have never done exactly what I tell them to do. So that's <laughs> refreshing. Yeah, it's control. I love yeah. it. Um, somebody, uh, so this says, Fahim wanted to know, how did you, how did you write chapter books? Um, Usually the idea will come to me out of the strangest places. I usually carry around um, a journal because sometimes I'll get an idea just walking around the street and I'll write the idea in my journal. So when I'm looking for a new idea, I can just open the book and there it is. Um, for this particular series, it started because I was um, at my parents' house and they had pictures of when we had visited Transylvania, Romania. And I was very lucky on that tour of Dracula's castle that they give, a friend of mine and I were hiding in a coffin so that when the tour came by we popped out and scared everybody half to death and my parents happened to have a picture of it um and i thought oh how fun to have kids travel all over the world and meet monsters and actually here's a sneak peek in book three fangs for having us that's exactly what happens that's and that's coming out soon right that's coming out in july yes. yeah and then yeah so that's exciting for everybody to keep an eye out for and uh, then you have another uh, one coming out after that well, I have another book that came out the same time as this one called Long Time No Sea Monster. Mm -hmm. And that takes place in Loch Ness, Scotland. And then there's Fangs for Having Us in July. And then I believe in the fall is when the fourth book is coming out. And that's called Get a Hold of Your Elf. And that takes place in Iceland. I love that. I think I read maybe like in September. So that would be awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Leah, Wade, Leah Wade said, I love your books. Well, thank you. Thank and Leah's so a smart kid because not only are your books great and entertaining, but every time she reads your books, she's educating herself so that she can do better in life and, and have a better life. So Leah, you're a smart kid. Keep reading. Thanks, um, Leah. Yeah, absolutely. That's what it's all about, right? Is that reading is so important. Um, when you're a kid, you don't really get it. But, you know, if you can get into a book, it can take you anywhere. But most we've also all that we've all needed that this year, I think books have been the greatest gift because even though you may have been stuck in your house or your apartment, if you read a book, you're taken to that place in time, that place, um, probably no one was wearing masks or, you know, had being tested up their nose. So it was nice to be able to read a book and go into a different reality for an hour or two. Mm -hmm. So I'm hoping that my books and other kids' books um, have helped you guys get through this mess. We get your books in all the time. I see like um, Princess Polarize. I want, it's, they're all, they're always people have bought them, read them, and then they're giving them to us to give to other kids to do it. And we love that because that's, um, you know, that's what our mission is all about. 
Um, but especially during this pandemic, we know that it's been a very difficult time for all of us, but for kids that have been at home and may not ha have uh, equal access to books as other kids, it's important that they know that we care about them and that they should have these books and they should want these books because that's what's going to take them to different worlds. Exactly. So we definitely, um, you know, appreciate your You've donated books to us as well. And I know you're going to donate some more books to us. So yep. we're excited for that. And we're yeah. grateful. I know it's exciting. Um, uh, one of the panelists wants to know, which one is your favorite book out of all of your books? I know. I was asking a mom, who's your favorite kid? I um, said that the other day. Yeah. The truth is, I, um, I write all these books and I do all that revising and all that rewriting so that I don't ever have to pick a favorite. Everyone is going to be just as funny as the one before. But I will say that the first book in any series is always the most exciting for me. It doesn't make it the favorite, but it certainly makes it the most exciting. Right, because it's where your, your, your creativity and your imagination starts with the whole character and the plot and things like that. That's great. Uh, Miss Fasina's class wants to know, were you inspired by the magic school bus? Well, you know, it's interesting. I worked on uh, the books that were based on the series, the TV, the original TV series. So I knew the magic school bus really well. I think um, there is some emphasis in that she's a very cool teacher. But for me, it was more, I've had some really cool teachers. And so she's sort of a mixture of a lot of teachers that I had. I'm not the one who compared this to the magic school bus, um, but okay. I'm so lucky. Yeah, um, yes, I, that's. She's more of um, a, a mix of a lot of teachers I had in elementary school that really supported me. I had a teacher in sixth grade who said, you know, I bet one day people are going to read stuff you write. And I thought she was nuts. Wow. Yeah. 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 I'm sure so, you went back and thanked that teacher and all the teachers that are on today and then that are watching yes, in the thank future. You. Thank you. Superheroes. Yes. Superheroes. I come from a long line of teachers. Yes. Uh, my daughter is a teacher. My father is a teacher. My grandmother was a teacher. My mother was a school social worker. So we are, we are thankful. Yes, and kid, kids don't always appreciate how much work it is for their teachers, even here today, our teachers are working hard, um, but it's a lot of work, and they truly care about each one of their students, and they're trying to help them make, you know, a, a better life for themselves, and that teacher that said that to you, that's amazing, um, I hope you went back to her in the future and said, yay, they're reading. <laughs> um, I get to go back to my elementary school to speak to the kids, and I was surprised at how small it was. It seemed much bigger <laughs> when I was there. It seems once you get out in the big world, you realize it. Uh, Shimu Khan wants to know, how do you come up with ideas for the books? Again, you know, I just see them outside. I remember one time I was at the hairdresser, and this woman came in with this I can't even describe it. And she said to the hairdresser, you have to fix this. This is terrible. And I had my journal with me, and I wrote looks like Katie Kazoo did her hair. And later on when I needed a Katie Kazoo idea, it became hair today, gone tomorrow. You never know where an idea is gonna come from. George Brown class clown is the character I did who has a magical super burp. And when he burps, he start, he's, goes out of control and starts doing crazy things. And that came because my son Ian was the class clown and he could burp the alphabet. So that just became a character. Um, it could burp the al alphabet. You know, so you don't know, Princess Pulverizer started out, my editor asked me mm -hmm. to write books about a, a dragon. But as I did the first draft, I was writing more and more as the princess and less and less as the dragon. And so I sort of flipped it and made the princess become the lead character and the dragon become a secondary character. So you don't know when you're doing that first draft, what's gonna happen sometimes you get a better idea and you go back and do it differently. Um, right. So that Which I is, anywhere. That's another lesson for all that's the kids that are, that for all the kids that are listening, right? It's sometimes you change directions when you're in the middle of writing something or, you know, you just got to get it down to the paper and then you can always go back and revise. And that's a good lesson for all the kids that are here. Um, Janine said, uh, your books are really good. Do you team up with some other authors to write books? And that okay. looks like uh, that's, oh, I'm sorry, what? That's 349Q she's from. Hi, um, I've only teamed up with one other author and that's my daughter, Amanda Burwasser. And um, she went to school for creative writing and we did a series together called Project Droid. Um, Amanda lives out in California. So that was a little tough because we were on different time zones and we wrote every single word together. Um, so we did six books 
and uh, she's doing some other writing as well, but she's also a teacher. Oh, that's great. And she's um, going to help you with some other stuff in the future, right? She's helping with me with a new series that I'm doing right now that is much younger than this. And I need to make sure that it's the right age level. Mm -hmm. um, and when did you start making longer books? Well, um, you know, I, I, I moved into, I was writing nonfiction for a very long time. Um, and I did some celebrity biographies and all kinds of things like that. Um, I think it took me about 10 years to start writing fiction and those books were longer um, because I had an editor who said to me one day, why don't you do fiction because then you can make everything up. <laughs> um, little did she know that you don't just make things up, you mm -hmm. also do the research to make sure that it's realistic while you're writing the fiction. Um, so I don't know, it was a while ago, um, but it's funny because kids always ask me about what's your longest book or something like that. And I have to say that I don't think it matters how long a book is. What matters about a book is, does it touch you? Do you understand it? Does it make you learn something about yourself? Does it make you learn something about someone else? I wouldn't focus on how long a book is. I would focus on how important it is in your life. Very well said. Um, Sadie wanted to know, do you write nonfiction? I don't anymore. I did for a long time. I was a magazine editor at Scholastic. I did kids magazines for a while, oh. um, but I don't. I really enjoy controlling the whole universe and you can really only do that with, with fiction. Right. Okay, that's awesome. Well, we're so grateful that you have been here and joined us again. Um, we can't, our mission is large and we can't do it without support from anybody, you know, authors, volunteers, all the different people that help us to do what we need to do. So we're grateful for that. Um, thank you for having me. Of I'll course. And I, I would be remiss if I didn't thank our sponsors who make this available. And that is uh, Mar Alarm Security, which our warehouse is generously donated by them. Uh, PC Richard is uh, a huge supporter of ours. Serena Associates, they do, they give us monthly donations. Investors Bank has really been just wrapping their arms around this event. And uh, most recently, Jovia Financial has joined in. So we have some great fundraising sponsors and partners. And uh, you're a partner and you'll I'm sure you'll be back next year. I hope you'll be back next year. Absolutely. I will see you next year, hopefully in person. That would be fantastic. All Thank right. you so much. And thanks to all the schools that joined and all the kids that behaved themselves and listened. Fun. Thanks, guys. Thank you so Keep much. Reading. Yes, keep reading. Reading is essential and it starts with the book. Thank you so much. Thanks. Bye-bye, everybody.